Hi, welcome back to the breadboard. This is the second of two part video covering the general assembly of the gantry and control board for my CNC project. Um, I've not gone into the details of e running every individual wire, but what I'm going to do now is give you an overview of what I've done and why I've done it uh, and show you how things are plumped together. I will be following this up with schematic diagrams and everything else so that you can see how it's wired and you don't necessarily have to do it this way. Um, I have a generous sponsor with RS Components that has sent me a lot of the parts that I'm using. So I was able to build up this board uh, nice and neatly to show you um, a preferred way of um, wiring up an, you know, an industrial control, uh, even, even if it's for home use. Uh, you know, some of the practices that I'm going to show you, you should really follow because it keeps things neat, tidy, easy to maintain and safe, which is quite important. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is um, take you through the control board. I've already done the previous video on the gantry and if you haven't seen that um, I'll put a link in the comments to it so that you can review that as well if you wish. If you built the gantry a completely different way or you have a completely different system and you're just interested in the controller then just keep on watching. Uh, it doesn't really matter which order you view these two videos in. Um, they'll both hopefully make sense to you anyway and will be both supported by schematics and things like that. So let's get into this. Okay, I've positioned the uh, camera high up looking down on the control board because I have it sitting on a chair just to make it easier to work on uh, at a slight angle. So excuse me looking at a like I'm a uh, funny angle anyway. Uh, so this is the control panel that I've wired for the CNC router. And if we start at the top, well, first of all, some obvious observations here. I've used plastic trunking, which is basically this stuff here. It comes in uh, meter lengths and you can just cut it down to suit the sizes that you want. And what this allows you to do is actually cable um, everything nice and neatly and keep it contained um, very, very simply. And it allows better maintenance in the future and things like that. And also um, I've routed my wires in different directions to keep power as far away as possible from uh, low voltage logic and stuff like that in order to make things a little more reliable. So if I just start at the very top here, let me just put this, I've just got a couple of these off so that I can show you what's inside, but I'm going to start at the top and work my way down. At the very top, uh, what I set up here is, let me just adjust the camera a bit, and zoom in. Okay. All right, so what we've got right at the top is the power supply section. So we have the mains coming in. I've used a standard connector here so that I can use an off-the-shelf cable for powering this up, but may also making it easy to disconnect um, if I needed to bring it inside to do some maintenance or reconfigure it or anything like that. What I've got is one of these standard connectors, um, and I've mounted it into a plywood enclosure that I made and bring the cables out underneath. Now they're all covered internally as well on the back with heat shrink tubing and there's a couple of transient suppressors also on the back of this thing just to give it a clean signal or a reasonably clean signal coming into the entire system. Now the first thing that happens with this cable is that it comes out the back here um, into this conduit, this cable trunking, and it comes out right here and goes into two fuses and what I've done is I've fused both the live and the negative um, side of the power supply here uh, to provide maximum protection. I've got six amp fuses in here right now but of course depending on what you put on your system you may need a lot more than that. And I've actually measured the current on the uh, big power supply here and it's actually not even drawing one amp when it's actually running all of the stepper motors. Now they're not under a great load um, so, the, you know, a six amp fuse is more than enough to cover all of this. So the output of the fuses um, go, there's two wires coming out of each of the fuse holders. One goes to each power supply. And the other part that I've got, of course, is the ground. And I put that onto a distribution block so that if I do need to run a ground to other things as well, I can take it right out of here and uh, route it to where I need it to go to. Um, for now, it just goes to the two power supply grounds. Everything else is sitting on uh, low voltage and not grounded to anything because it's all, um, it's not necessary for what there is because it's all plastic and isolated and everything else. Um, 
So I've marked everything to give me indicators as well as to what its function is and where the, roughly where the cables are so that when I'm pulling it around and messing with things, I know what I'm dealing with. And of course, you should never be doing that with the power on anyway, but it's always good to be aware of um, what voltages and currents are going to be involved in certain areas of the trunking so that you can avoid routing, say, uh, low voltage logic alongside 110 volt mains and things like that. Anyway, so yeah, mains into the entire controller through some fuses with a ground bus, which is not fused, of course. Um, nice big, gives me multiple connections, mains out to my power supply. So we have a 24 volt power supply for sensors and additional things like PLCs, etc. We also have a large 10 amp 48 volt power supply, which is used to drive the stepper motors through the controllers. Now, I've seen in the forums a lot of people saying, well, my stepper motor is only 3 volts. Why are you driving it with 48 volts? And the people get very, very confused about how stepper motors work. And I will be doing a separate video on the theory behind stepper motors and everything else. But suffice to say right now that in a, the way that a stepper motor controller works is it relies on the inductive nature of the stepper motors because obviously any motor is based on a magnetic coil and the instant you energize a coil an inductor it does not go to maximum current right away it's not just the dc resistance which may be only a few hundred milliohms it's the in it's the reactance at the point of applying the power that controls how much current there is um, and then obviously that rapidly diminishes as the current increases um, and that's what your stepper motor controller does is it allows you to control the amount of current and power going into the stepper motors. So by having a high voltage, it allows you to deliver a lot of power into the stepper motor, but at a controlled current. And then as the motors move faster and faster, um, you can apply more voltage and less current. It's just the nature of the, the way they work. And as I said, I will be going into a more detailed discussion about that. So um, anyway, 48 volts is a good voltage to use for NEMA 23 style stepper motors that basically have a uh, around a 3, 3.5 volt uh, voltage rating and around about 2.93, 4 amp current rating. Uh, 48 volts is really good, but you can use anything from uh, 12 volts up to about, you know, sort of 75-ish, 80 volts for these stepper motors. But the, what the basic recommendation is, is about um, 25 times the voltage maximum. Uh, I'll, I'll go into the theory. Anyway, 48 volts is a good voltage to use. If all you have is a 24 volt power supply, that will work as well. You get the benefit of more power if you use a higher voltage power supply, that's all. Um, if you've got plenty of power anyway, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so coming down for the wiring, um, the two power supplies I've got, the 24 volt one brings its power out of the top of the unit and I've used a blue cable with the black ground coming into the conduit and I've actually routed this around the right hand side and the reason for that is because the mains is in this section of the conduit and I don't want to route the DC output past the mains cables for obvious reasons. They're going to pick up noise and everything else. I want to keep it as clean as I can. Um, so I route it around this edge down and then across sorry, all the way down here and then across here to come out to these distribution blocks. The 48 volt power also comes down and around this side, um, comes down here and then comes into here as well. So I this basically this piece of the conduit is currently empty down here. And the reason for that again is because I want to keep it for future use and because to get to it I would have to go past the mains um, cabling which is in this part. So I basically reserve the DC over here and the AC over here. So this is the power section and uh, basically we're running down to the distribution panel. So you can't see that right now. So let me just adjust the camera. I'm keeping it um, closer in rather than show you the whole thing only because I want to be able to um, let you have a, a bigger picture of what's happening with this. So let me just flip down to the next section. All right, so what we have is that we've got the 24 volts and the 48 volts coming from the power supplies. And I've used a blue wire to indicate the 24 volt output from the power supplies and a red heavy gauge cable for the 48 volt output from the power supply. When we come down to through the um, trunking and we come out here, 
um, you'll see that the 48 volt one comes out and is connected to this distribution block. Um, all five of these connections are all um, bus barred together internally. So basically if you've got one supply coming in, I've basically got five, six, seven, eight, nine available taps from that one connection. So it makes it a good star distribution point. Uh, and then the sec second one is a common ground. And with any control system, you really want to try and have all of your grounds going to a common place to try and eliminate um, current loops and things like that that could cause problems later on. And then the third block I have here is my 24 volt power supply distribution point. Now, what I've also done is I've used some cable ties and rather than cut them really, really short, I've left a little bit of a um, tab on them up here so that, uh, let me just zoom in a little closer so you can see that. All right, I put a little tab on them and I've actually marked it 48 volts DC, 24 volts DC. And the other end of the cable too, I've also marked on the power supplies. So you can see here the output of the 48 volt one, I've also put a corresponding cable tie marking the fact that this is the 48 volt DC output. All right, back down to here. Okay, so one of the things to note then, which I guess I've just discussed, is if you keep your cables neat and try and mark them as best you can to indicate their function. Um, I don't have, you can, you can get actual um, cable markers that go on the cable itself. And normally if this was an industrial installation, you would have every single cable marked with a number at each end of it so that no matter where you were, if you saw a cable that was marked as say number five and you found that number five somewhere else, then you would know that that's the same cable. In my case, I don't have those markers, but what I have done is I've marked the ones that are important um, to be able to figure out how things work. And that is things like the high power, I've used a different colored cable and I've also put a cable tie on it. And if you look here on these ones, you'll see that I've put some black markers on the various cables, um, one, two, three, four strips on it. And then if you go down to the gecko controllers, you'll see that you've, I've got the corresponding four, three, two, one on these as well. So I know which ones of these come down to the controller. So if I wanted to disconnect it here or here, I know exactly which one to do without having to unwire everything. Okay. Um, what I've also done is put a lot of labels on the tops of the trunking. So I know which thing is doing what function. So I've got 24 volt DC output, common ground, or sorry, common zero volts, 48 volts bus distribution here. And then I've got my X, Y right, Y left, and Z stepper drive controller. And then of course I've got the Arduino, which is pretty obvious, but I've marked it anyway. Um, 24 volt to seven volt DC adapter going into the Arduino. And then for inputs, I've got my stepper motor connections and I've got my limit switches. Now I am going to further mark these by putting some um, markers on the actual aluminum here to say that this is X, Y, Z, um, X, Y, right, Y, left, and Z for the stepper motor controller as well, or Z for those in England. Um, so get down to the stepper motor controllers, you'll notice here that I have the these ribbon cable connections um, coming out of the uh, direction step and common of the gecko controllers coming up and running across here. I've tried to minimize how much interference there would be from the power which actually goes off to this left side and around here. Uh, my logic control going to the Arduino comes off around this side down and into this side to go into the Arduino controller. And these are um, these inputs to the gecko controllers are optically isolated so I'm literally not connecting the Arduino here to anything that's high power over here is completely isolated. Yes, the ground is connected to a common uh, ground bus and that's necessary, but not essential in this case because this could actually be completely isolated power supply if I wanted it to be. Um, I'm using a DC to DC converter here so it's actually sharing the same common zero volts. Um, if you didn't want to use one of these and you wanted to use a simple mains based little uh, wall watt, you, then it would be just fine to do that too. 
Um, anyway, so I've got the optically isolated inputs of these four Gecko drives being driven from the normal logic output from the Arduino Uno, which is an 18 mega 328. Now, because these are the, even though these are uh, LEDs inside here doing the optical, they take very very little current. They're measured only in a few milliamps. So um, I've got my YR and YL stepper motors um, connected together as far as the inputs, and that's this extra wire that runs up and then back down into here. And the reason for that is because I have two stepper motors on the gantry for the Y axis, which is the one that drives it um, from the front of the table to the back of the table, because you're, there is a lot of weight on the gantry. I haven't weighed it yet, but I will do before I'm done to see how heavy it is. So two stepper motors are being used there because of the power required to drive that forward and backward and to keep it nice and level. I'm um, sorry, keep it from racking, from twisting or anything like that. So there's two stepper motors though, they need to run in opposite directions. But of course, I don't want to add additional control and the Arduino Uno doesn't have enough pins to drive these individually. So I've paralleled them here and actually on the stepper motor, I've actually swapped the, the windings of one of the stepper motors so that it runs in the opposite direction of the other, which actually results in the gantry running the correct way for both steppers. Um, I've done it there because if I if I actually wired it here, it's too easy to forget that one of these is crossed. Um, and you know, if I ever replaced it or something, and then I could easily get it wrong, and I would basically break something on the CNC later on. So I've kept everything consistent in all the wiring for these Gecko drives, and I've dealt with the nuances of the stepper motor at the stepper motor itself. So each of the stepper drives, you've got the power, which is the plus and minus heavier gauge here. This is a 14 gauge wire that I've used. Um, as you notice, I used the 12 gauge wire coming in for the power, and I've used 14 gauge wire from the distribution down to each of the gecko drives. And then I've used 18 gauge wire from the gecko drives out to the stepper motors all the way through. Um, these, these cables here simply go into the conduit around the side. You can see this one is pretty full because it's got um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 16 cables just for stepper drives and then you've got another 8 cables for the power to go to them. So you've got a lot of wires in here. Um, they come right through and they connect up to these connectors and these are simple Amphenol. Um, they're weatherproof. They're designed for this. They're 5 amp rated so they've got more than enough capacity. The Gecko drives will drive up to 7 amps but the stepper motors I have connected, the NEMA 23's, they only draw about 3 amps. I think it's like 2.9... yeah about 3 amps. So these have got more than enough capacity uh, for what I need. And they're nice and neat and easy to uh, wire up and, and connect. So. Um, they just connect here. I've used a, um, I've just reused an old piece of aluminum that I had to make a bracket to mount onto the table for the uh, Amphenol sockets to go on, and then I'm going to hang this entire control board on the wall in the uh, in the garage when I take it out there later to build up the main part of the CNC. But because I've got this on a separate board, I'm able to build it up in in the house where it's nice and warm right now. Um, and be able to bring it in later for maintenance if I need to without having to do a whole boatload of uh, decoupling. All I do is I pull the mains plug out from the top and I disconnect these uh, connectors at the bottom and then the whole board I can just pick it up and bring it in or take it to a workbench somewhere or something like that to work on it. So again the other thing I've marked down here again is I've used the Dymo machine to create labels for each of the um, gecko drives so that I know, sorry, that one goes on here, um, so I know which gecko drive is for what. I didn't put it on the gecko drive itself because again if I pull that out and put another one in the likelihood of me putting a label on again is pretty slim. So, um, or finding the labeler is pretty slim. So I've just left them bare and I've used the markings on the conduit lids itself. Okay, now going back to the conduit, there's two things here that I've, I've got uh, which is used very, very often in industrial engineering for making panels like this. One is these DIN rails. Um, a lot of these controllers systems will use DIN rails to mount the components on. The power supply at the top here, uh, these are all DIN rail mountable. And if I just go grab one of the other power supplies I have for a second. Um, 
Like this is another one of the 24 volt power supplies. This is the bottom. You can see here the DIN rail has got a very solid mounted um, bracket on the bottom and the DIN rail hooks into here and then clamps down onto the rail so that um, it's hanging on the top, which is the two metal brackets. Basically, this is the top of the power supply. So it would hang here. A gravity will keep it on and flat. And then you've got this plastic clip, which keeps it in place from you know coming off easily and things like that. And to release it, you just have to get a screwdriver to the end of this. So when it's this way round, you can get to this with a screwdriver. You just pull it out and then the power supply would just come off the rail um, quite easily like that and you'd be able to replace it very very quickly. It also allows you to move things around a little bit um, as you're wiring up and everything. Now the other part of this of course is you can get um, you know normal industrial environment too. This would actually be inside a case of some sort and allow you to um, you know keep it completely enclosed and everything else. I've built it on this board because I want to be able to easily show you um, what's what on it and how it works and also once I have it in the garage it's going to be mounted up on the wall on a bigger panel and I want to be able to easily point to things and stuff like that while I'm doing stuff um, and I, what I may well do though is put a, um, a maybe a plexiglass cover over it to keep the uh, dust and everything put a little shield over the top maybe um, and a plexiglass cover over the front just to keep hands away from it not that hands are going to get near it because it's going to be up and out the way um, but also to be able to just keep the dust because obviously once we start cutting wood and things like that there is going to be dust floating around and it's going to settle around here. So that's the main part of the panel. Oh, there was one thing I wanted to mention down here. So why have I got this extra board on the Arduino here? Let me just zoom right in close to it to let you see. So on the Arduino here I've got this daughter board. It's just a prototyping board and what I've done is the as I mentioned before, these stepper motor controllers, for the direction, step, and common on these things, they're optically isolated, but um, the disable, which I haven't wired in yet, which basically turns the current off driving the steppers, it doesn't do anything other, else other than turn off the output stage, um, which you would lo link into things like e-stops or something like that, is not optically isolated from the 24 volt supplies. And also the um, limit switches that come in from the field, the way that they show you the Gecko, um, sorry, the um, Gerbil controllers that use the Arduino Unos working is they have the limit switches, whether they're mechanical or electronic, coming from the head that's moving around where the sensor is all the way to the controller um, without anything in between it. And the problem with that is that you've got... Um, you know, 10 to 20 feet of cable that could pick up noise and various other things. And I found with a little bit of experimentation in previous times that the Arduino will not necessarily detect that reliably. And, you know, in a little bit of testing when I still had this sitting on the bench, I also found that even in this case with the whole effect sensors, they're not relays or anything else. They're an NPN transistor still wouldn't get the volts low enough to trigger the limit switch or they would <clears throat> you know the 5 volt rail on here the, the Arduino the way it's programmed is it tells the inputs to use an internal uh, pull-up resistor which would typically bring it up to 5 volts but because of the cable length um, even though the NPN transistor was grounding that end of the signal you've got probably you know 20 30 feet of cable that is also dropping a little bit of volts as well and so you were not getting um, a high enough voltage when it was off for it to be detected as a logic one. It was very, very flaky, you know. Uh, so I, what I decided to do was actually put an opto isolator there. I supply the opto isolator with um, 24 volts because the switches are quite happy to handle it. I've got 1K resistors, uh, indicator LEDs, and then the opto isolator LEDs and then out to the actual uh, limit switches. So now I've got a reasonable amount of current that's going to be drawn through those switches to illuminate the um, LEDs, uh, especially the ones that are inside the opto isolator, which is in this device here. And then I have on the other side, I've got um, Darlington outputs of these uh, opto isolator going to the input pins of the Arduino, which used to be the ones that were right here. Um, and now, so what I've got is that 
I've got complete isolation of the limit switches. So if something goes wrong in the far end, I'm not going to um, fry the Arduino. And I'll show you a picture in a minute of something I um, oopsie accidentally did with my Arduino. I'm trying to find out where it is. It's over there. I'll go show you in a minute. I did make that mistake while I was wiring this before I built this. I actually had two wires crossed on one of the sensors. Didn't realize it. And when I powered it up the first time, um, I got the proverbial smoke. Unfortunately, I didn't have it under uh, the camera, so I don't have a picture to show you, but I do have the uh, fried AT Mega 328 and on the board that I can show you. So, you know, having the extra isolation here for the limit switches is a good idea. Now, this is a quad opto isolator, so what I can do is the fourth opto isolator I'm going to use for the enable output going back to these. Um, as, so that I got complete isolation. The only connection I have now then with this to anything else is via the, just the zero volt connection. All of the main drive connections and everything else is going to be going through up to isolators. I have a little bit of extra room on this board too in case I want to add another one. Because what I don't have in this design yet is physical um, start, stop, reset, resume switches that would normally be on the front of the table or something uh, within easy reach of the operator. It's all via the... Um, I'll either have the e-stop or I'll have the uh, laptop slash computer that's doing the driving of this whole thing. And it will respond to that. But of course, if the software goes haywire, then or, um, you know, the connectivity to the, the Arduino goes on the fritz, I'm not going to be able to stop it doing anything. And there may be things in the buffer, so it may keep cycling for a few more um, Step. So by having some direct switches connecting to this allows me to um, have some non-laptop based control, which is probably going to be good for a safety reason. All right. So that's what I've done down here. And again, as I said, I'm going to provide full schematics um, laid out uh, so that you can see exactly how this is all wired. It looks like a lot. And, you know, bec probably because I've used these um, because I've used this trunking and things like that, it makes it look a lot more professional. But these things are very, very cheap to get this trunking and everything else. And I think you'll agree that having it wired like this makes it very, very neat. And it's a definite benefit to have. If I want to rewire something or adjust something, I just have to flip these tops off of these trunking. They just clip on. They're a little bit funny to get off. You know, you've got to mess around because they're designed to stay on there firmly um, and they click in. So you have to pre push in the uh, the the, spring, the plastic. It's, it's quite springy, so it's fairly easy to do. And then just slowly lift it off. Or if you get one end up, you can slide it off of them. When you put it back on again, of course, you just have to put it in place and it just clips clips on quite easily. Says me. All right, just like that. And there it is, it's done. All right, and the same for that one. I'll do that one later. Um, so we're, while we're on the subject of safety, one of the things that I've also done with this is I've, first of all, I, I created a, um, effectively a safety brick for my lab use a little while ago and did a video for it. But one of the things that I um, had comments on was about using one of these kind of connectors. I can't remember off the top of my head what the name is. Anyway, this you'll find this on the back of most instruments and everything else. And I have a few of these. Some of them I've been recovering from old equipment that got thrown out. Um, but I also have some that I ordered. You can get them from eBay. You can get them from RS Electronics and lots of other places. They're very, very common and, you know, definitely worthwhile putting into your system to make it easy to uh, connect the mains to it. And what I've done is the wires at the back, as I said, come straight out of here and up to these connections um, further down so that I have um, easy access. All right. There we just trying to adjust the camera a little bit. There we go. So you've got out of here, straight around here, and straight onto these three connections. And then from there, everything else is distributed. So I've got two fuses because even if you made a mistake in your wiring up here, you're protected both on the live and the neutral. Because neutrals aren't always necessarily ground depending on your region or community or country. Uh, in my case, live is 110 volts and the neutral is actually connected to ground at the transformer out in the uh, street or whatever it is. So even though there's a separate ground connection, um, 
the neutral here is also a ground is, is also grounded but not in the house so you shouldn't treat it as the ground uh, but I fuse them all anyway to make sure that I'm completely covered even if somebody faulty wired something um, and then the mains comes up to here these units the power supplies are also individually fused in their own right um, inside them so there's not an issue with that too and I actually do want to talk about power supplies in another video uh, these ones, as you can clearly see, have been uh, provided to me by RS Components, which is very, very nice. And they're, they're actually made by uh, Meanwell in Taiwan. I think it's Taiwan. Yep. Uh, Meanwell is a very, very good make, uh, Taiwanese make, and a lot of companies use them. And I've got a lot of different products that use them as well. But I also have a bunch of power supplies here that I bought off of eBay just for playing around with. And what I'm going to do is, in a separate video, I'm going to show you the difference between buying a quality power supply and buying a, let's just say, dubious quality power supply from eBay. And you might be shocked at what you will see. Um, the, the only point I'm going to make right now is that if you had a fault with a power supply, what is that worth to you time-wise? Because even though these power supplies may be, uh, say, $100, 100, sorry, you know, maybe $150 or $200, I think they're about 100 pounds um, UK price, which is where these came from. Um, and you could get one from eBay for maybe, you know, $50, $60. That means you've, you've saved yourself, you know, $50 to $100 in costs to buy the basic unit. But if this failed, how much is that going to cost you while you fix it? Maybe because of bad engineering or something like that. You know, so for some projects, maybe a cheap ass power supply might be all you need and that's fine. And if you, you know, if it failed, uh, it has no consequence. But if you're building this to do a little cottage industry or an industrial control solution where you actually depend on it for a living or anything like that, where time is money, literally, uh, then it's really not worth skimping on buying substandard or dubious quality parts. Um, that's one of the reasons why when I was working with RS Components to come up with a list of things that I wanted to include in this, um, I included the power supplies, the stepper controllers, DIN rails, you know, the trunking, all of that stuff I wanted to include because I wanted to show you how you could put together a system without too much money um, that is safe, it's it's pretty good quality and will still achieve the job without breaking the bank. Now obviously you know, if you're not using a building as big a CNC as the one I'm doing here then you could probably get away with smaller step motors, smaller power supply and things like like that and you may you know skip the uh, distribution connector points and use uh, what's commonly referred to as a chocolate block which is basically just a strip of um, connectors with little screw terminals on. Uh, you can pick those up pretty much all over the place including Irish components as well um, and that's fine. Um, I just wanted to show you what you could achieve w within a reasonable budget as well. So anyway, that's part of it, to come back to this. So that's my mains input. But one of the other things that I wanted to show you is I want to be able to kill the power to all of this very, very easily and very, very quickly. So what I did, um, I'm a woodworker as well as a hobby, hence building this CNC router and things like that, is I wanted to be able to um, shut the power off easily. And anybody that's done woodworking in the past will know that pretty much all of the equipment actually comes with um, mostly one of these switches. So what this will do, I'm just going to unplug the back, is it first and foremost it's a safety switch. So when it's off you can pull this little thing out and now I cannot switch this on. All right, It just won't. And this is going to be mounted to the front of my table uh, in a position where I'm not going to easily knock it as I'm moving around the table when I'm doing work but somewhere where I can easily get to it and just go bang and knock and it will kill the power off of everything. The stepper motors, the computer, everything that's connected to this mains up on the top of the board, it will kill the power. But when you put this little plug in, and having the plug out by the way is a great safety thing if you've got kids and you don't want them messing with it, when you're not there take this out and lock it away somewhere, they can't turn it on. All right? You put this back in and now the switch will work. All right? Now this particular one is probably $30 or something like that, but you can get smaller ones um, or you could use an e a you know, resettable e-stop switch or one with a key on it or something like that if you wanted. But on the back of this one it has two um, outlets which are rated for 10 amps each. So one, one of them I'm going to use to connect to my um, spindle 
and the other one is going to be connected to this power um, to power this whole um, controller circuit so on the back you, this is the connector going to my control circuit it's actually not plugged in right now let me just plug the other end in let me zoom out a little bit so I have a really nice long um, and heavy duty mains cable here now obviously in Canada we run on 110 volts so our cables for a certain power have to be a lot lot thicker to carry the current without losing too many volts so that just plugs in the top here this would run down to the front of the table and be connected to this all right and then this would connect to whatever I'm going to be using to power everything so this would just plug in the back as one of the connections and um, that's it so that will be at the front of the table now this is ready to power up it's actually turned on right now so I would just turn that on and now it's all powered up now um, if in an emergency I had a problem that's it it's killed the power so everything would stop very very, very quickly so that's um, a very important safety thing is you want to be able to kill the power um, you know it, whether it's because you got snagged in the machinery um, anybody can just hit this or if it's within your reach you can hit it of course you should have e-stops on the table as well and we are talking about dangerous machinery we're building this ourselves for home use but it is a machine with a cutting blade and it's got motors and everything else that can hurt you so you've got to be aware of safety at all times so this is going to be part of mine along with e-stops um, the other part of course is having things like if, if as necessary um, ground fault circuit breakers and stuff like that too um, so this is going to be at the front of the machine to turn things on and off with easily uh, and this is actually currently as you've seen in the previous video my controller here is wired up to my gantry that's sitting right on beside me so what I'm going to do right now is just to close off with this is to show you um, a little bit of this working just before I start taking it out into the garage um, to actually wire it up to the real thing So what I'm focusing on right now is the um, carriage limit switch. All right, this is a whole effect sensor, um, and when it gets over this screw, it will trip and should stop the travel moving any further in that direction. It's not a physical limit switch, although it is treated as one. It's obviously because it's optical, it doesn't physically stop it moving any further. Um, but it does control um, the the system, and it will cause the um, gecko control. Sorry, the Gerbil controller to stop completely instantly travel in the direction when it whatever direction it was going in when it hits it in fact it will stop travel of the head in all directions because when you hit these limit switches that is regarded as a critical error it should never ever hit them in normal operation um, so I'm going to power the system up right now you won't see anything but you might hear a little buzz from the steppers okay so I've just powered this up now where's my ruler gone I need something metal just to show you because I can't move the steppers anymore. Well, I'll grab a screwdriver. So I'm going to use a little screwdriver and I'm just going to put it underneath here and you'll see it light up. All right, it's got a little LED in it, which is probably why it takes the current that it does. And as soon as you get close, it will light up and it's actually grounding the input to my... Um, up to isolators on the Arduino board. So if I just flip across to the Arduino now and show you that, you will see. I'm just going to, hopefully, not going to cover up anything. I'm just trying to do this without blocking the camera. Now, you'll see I'm just doing that same carriage sensor and it's you see the LED lighting. So that gives me a local controller uh, view that one of the limit switches has gone off. The Gerbil, the, um, Gerbil controller doesn't actually tell you which limit switch it's, it's hit. It just tells you that it hit a limit switch. So it'll just stop and that'll be it. But if you know with the LED which one is causing the issue, then obviously that's a good thing. So I'm just manually with a screwdriver tripping this one right now. So... Okay, so that's that one. Now, um, the way that all of this works, just to show you, I'm going to obviously do this more fully um, later. 
zoom out a little bit. As I said, excuse all the mess on the table, multiple projects on the go all at the same time here. Um, one of the things that you can do even before you've put this on the main part of the um, CNC is test your carriage mo motion and see that the limit switching system is working properly. So let me just log into my um, laptop here. So there's a number of different programs you can use. I'm just using Google Controller just for the moment. Um, there are different ones have different issues. Google Controller is free. There's also the universal G-code loader and there's also um, a couple of web-based ones which are actually they seem to be quite good and handle a few things. Uh, most people though once they get beyond um, the basics seem to be going for uh, the Mac 3 software. It costs about $150 to register but it's really the one that takes you from being um, hobbyist up to sort of like cottage industry um, a little bit more serious um, hobby or semi-professional use um, used by a lot of people and very well supported uh, but for now I'm just using Google controller I've just connected to the CNC uh, controllers here so I'm actually looking at that and now what I can actually do um, theoretically is I should be able to um, move the carriage I have to set a feed rate first though so I set F500 for 500 millimeters a minute and now I should be able to control this so one thing you want to make sure is you get the right speeds and things so I'm just moving this right now it's set to a um, step size of 10 so every time I hit it it will move 10 millimeters now I'm going to do a separate video uh, short one because these are getting a little bit long that will actually discuss exactly how to tune the Gerbil controller for your stepper motors because you need to know factors that include um, the pitch of the belt that you're using, the number of teeth on the pulley you're using, the number of steps per revolution of your um, stepper motors and you know things like that. And they all factor in for you to be able to set this thing up to be accurate um, going forward. So I'm just looking for my ruler because I wanted to just do a little test. Just give me a second and I'll come right back. Okay, this is just a close-up of the head, and I just put a ruler with the millimeters against the uh, gantry there. It's just sitting loose, so it's just just touching, but it's not going to move or anything when I move the head, so don't worry about that. Um, I've aligned it up with the 20 mark, and so I've actually set the parameters on mine already, and as I said, I'll go into that in a separate video, and I've told it to move um, by 10 millimeters. So if I just, I'm gonna, it should go from the uh, 20 to the 19 because as I said it's only 10 millimeters all right and you can see that it's right on the 19 now and if I do that again it'll go to the 18 okay now I can obviously you know increase that to be um, I can just simply say or type in a command to do a specific amount so I do G 0, 01 space um, x30 for example and there you saw it moved exactly 30 millimeters now I can bring it back you know I'm just typing in commands at the, and the as well so if I want to bring it back um, a full 100 millimeters so 10 centimeters I just put in a negative command so I do g01 space x minus 100 and it will come right back. Now my feed rate is only set to 500 millimeters a minute, which is not too fast. Obviously the steppers are capable of going much, much faster. And there you go. So that's a little quick, basic demo of, um, there we go, as you can see, right back to 25. Um, actually, let me just move it. So I'm gonna deliberately make it go to where the head is. I'm quite close right now, but I'm still about 10, centim 10 millimeters away here. So I'm gonna tell it to do that. I'm gonna do that exact same command again. And what you'll see is it will completely lock up the CNC because like I said, that is regarded as a critical error. So I'm gonna input the G minus 100 again, which would actually take it off the end of the gantry if I actually sent it. But you'll see it'll hit the end stop. Bang, all right. 
the light came on and it just stopped it right there and then. So you can see it's not right over the top of the screw, which is fine. Uh, and the screw is close enough that it is going to detect it. Um, and you can adjust the height of this, of course, if you want. And I can slide it to and fro as well to adjust where I want that end stop to be. And you can see here, I've got probably a couple of inches still. Um, so I could afford to move this end stop closer um, from where it is right now. All right, I've got about an inch of extra play here, and I can also move this screw to the next one. These brackets I actually made myself um, from some um, right angle aluminum that I got from the local Home Depot, uh, but you can buy them as well, ready made up with the screw holes and slots and everything already in them. Uh, I just happened to have a three foot length of this, so it was easy for me to just cut them on my um, miter saw out in the garage and then just drill the holes and I made a template using a bit of an off cut of one of these um, extrusions and it was quite easy so I'll maybe talk about that in another video as well but anyway that pretty much completes the um, you know the electrical overview and the mechanical wiring uh, sorry electrical wiring on the gantry and the overview of the controller board um, it actually is not complicated it, there's a lot of things you have to wire up and it's probably taken me um you know many days i've probably been at wiring this on and off for about a week for all the pieces um, experimenting with a few things as well hopefully the experiences and the tips that i'm giving you uh, for like using old um, power supply to uh, hard drive controller um, power connectors and stuff like that um, is one that you will take away and they'd be quite useful um, using conduit, using DIN rails, um, free software, uh, you know, some of the things like, as I said, the, the tank track kind of um, stuff that, like that, you know, it's, it's a nice to have. And, um, but if you don't have it, uh, you can get away with other solutions, uh, which have the wires a little looser but there is a risk of them catching and fraying and various other things this protects the cables uh, and everything else as I say even this conduit here all right is not essential you could come along the top and just use a couple of cable ties to loop around the end of the uh, brackets and things and that would be fine um, I think if I had to say one thing about all of this cable management is the one essential thing I would really suggest that you do have in your CNC is this tank track, the flexible tracking going from the moving part because it will make your cables last longer. It will give you a more reliable system. You're less likely to have the cables catching in things and doing damage or, you know, you could have an expensive piece of wood or plastic or aluminum on your bed that you're cutting and all it takes is one cable to get snagged and you're going to ruin that piece, you know, and that piece of aluminum might've cost you 50 bucks or more, the wood or whatever it might be. That could be an expensive job for the sake of, you know, um, the price of a piece of um, flexible tracking to protect the cables. It really isn't worth not doing it, you know, but as I said, if you've got a much smaller system and, and things like that, then, you know, uh, you, you've, you've got to be your own judge, but don't say I didn't warn you.